Dark Side Dreams by A. King Bradley. Story 2, Me Too. Chapter 1, San Francisco, California, September 7th, 2093. On a cold, windy day in autumn, Gwen Wolf stepped out of her high-tech luxury sedan and reached up to touch her hair to make sure it was still in place. She squinted, leaning into the wind as she struggled up the sidewalk, her coattails flapping around her legs. There was a gentle, fading hum as her car's maestro AI system shut the vehicle's doors and zoomed off to find more permanent parking. Soon, Gwen passed by a plate-glass storefront, the kind of glass that is shiny and smooth, reflective. On muscle memory, she looked into it and swiveled her head around. It took her a moment to realize what she was doing, looking for bruises, gouges, contusions. But there weren't any, of course. Not anymore. Not for a while. In some ways, that was the most frightening thing of all. She turned away from the window and hurried on, shaking her head. She wondered briefly how long the habit would persist. In thirty years, would she still be looking in reflective surfaces every time she left her home, making sure no signs of abuse stood out? A few blocks up, she stepped through a door into the shadowy entry room of a cafe. Music played from somewhere. There was a clatter of crockery banging around. A deep, rich smell of fresh coffee and old books. A nice place. She came here often. Used to be two or three times a week, just to escape the horror of daily life. She would just sit in a lonely corner with her scarf and her big sunglasses, occasionally checking her makeup as she sipped coffee and read her way through the latest trash novel she was into. Escapist stories. Young, beautiful women being swept away by charming billionaires who never insulted them or hit them. And there she was. Once a young, beautiful woman herself. She had been swept away, all right, by a charming billionaire. But nothing else was the same. Not the same as in her books. Today, her business in the cafe was quite different. She strode through the main dining area, scanning the scattered patrons. She saw her man, sitting in a back corner, tapping away at the screen of a data slate and jittering his legs nervously. He fit the description she had been given over the phone when hiring him. About thirty years old, a neatly trimmed beard, a penchant for peacoats and ruffled jeans. Gwen slid into the seat across from him. There was already a cup of coffee waiting for her. Black, no sugar, the way she liked it. She had sort of forgotten what it was like, being near a man who actually cared about her preferences. Not that this was anything other than a brief professional relationship. She had never even met this guy before. Not in person. You must be Gwen, he said, without taking his eyes off his work. Sorry, don't mean to be rude. Just checking a few facts quickly. Don't want to present you with any false information. But I think we're good. Your, um, friend said you were the best in the city, Gwen said quietly, folding both hands around her cup, putting one leg over the other, suddenly feeling quite vulnerable, like a weak girl doing something foolish and misguided. Well, I wouldn't say that myself, he replied, setting his slate down and looking up with small, warm brown eyes. Because there are no real metrics out there for it, and because I like to think I am quite humble, as humble as a dashing rogue can be anyway. Gwen smiled. She didn't feel comfortable enough to laugh. The man seemed to realize something. He pantomimed, smacking himself in the head, then stuck his hand out to shake with her. Oscar Graves, he said. Just to be clear, you hired me to act as your private investigator and not for any of the other trades I offer, correct? Gwen turned her cup around nervously. What other trades do you offer? That depends. On what? It depends on what you need, Oscar said darkly. I, I just need surveillance. That's all, Gwen whispered, suddenly feeling even more paranoid. Got it. Just wanted to make sure. When people are hiring for this kind of work, they tend to be a bit... I don't know, I guess clandestine is not too strong a word. They sometimes talk in code, you know. 
use ambiguous terminology and such. Gwen chuckled. Was that how I acted on the phone? A little bit? Sorry, I... No worries. You're nervous. You're new to this whole thing. You haven't done it before. And now you've asked me to investigate your husband, the person you vowed to trust and cherish and love, and yada yada forever and ever, right? It can be scary. But look, I totally understand. My mom was in a similar situation, with my dad. He could get... mean, you know? But that's not what we're talking about here. He twisted the data slate around so that she could see the screen. She saw a huge list of collapsible bullet points. Tapping each one brought a whole other tree of bullet points out. Nested folders of them, dozens and dozens. Most of them had links in them, leading to still shots or short clips of video. This is what I've been able to gather, Oscar explained. Most of it is probably junk, just ordinary stuff. But you never know. To put a puzzle together, sometimes it's also important to find out what pieces don't fit. So you can discard them and distill the whole thing down. For instance, I know that your husband likes to stop at a specific convenience store for a mid-afternoon pick-me-up. Usually a cold brew coffee. Is that relevant to the investigation? Probably not. But then again, maybe it is. We just don't know until later. In forensics, this sort of thing happens a lot. A thorough, overly cautious detective scrapes a bit of paint off a car or a bit of dirt from someone's shoe. Then, a decade later, that piece of evidence is found to contain a crucial clue. Gwen's head was on the verge of spinning. This guy loved to hear himself talk, but he probably spent most of his time silent and alone, skulking around in shadows. Anyway, he added, let's get things straight here, because I'm not sure I actually heard you right on the phone. You're worried that your husband is being unfaithful, right? Yes. Gwen answered. That's correct. Okay, that's a fairly common thing for me, but this is the part that I'm uncertain about. The reason you think he's being unfaithful is that he used to... He looked around, making sure no one was close enough to hear. He used to abuse you. But now he isn't doing that anymore? Gwen nodded. Right. He hasn't laid a hand on me in over a month, romantically or violently. We went to counseling, and after that it's like he transformed overnight, a complete and abrupt change. I think the lack of sensual touch is because of some kind of shame, the shame that comes from being unfaithful, and it's also the reason he hasn't hit me lately. Someone else is stealing his passion away. He basically just ignores me. It's like I don't even exist to him anymore. Oscar nodded. And do you think this change of demeanor might have just resulted from the counseling? Gwen shook her head. No, he barely paid attention at our sessions. He bitched and moaned about them all the way home. Even now he'll make an occasional remark about how worthless counseling is. I think something else happened around the same time, just a coincidence. Okay, you also mentioned he is seeing some other specialist? Yeah, someone he works with referred him to this guy, some kind of masculine health guru but I think he just goes to those sessions because the guy is fun to talk to. They aren't the reason for his change, either. Any other ideas? Oscar asked. Any clue as to what might have caused his behavioral change? Gwen shook her head. Nothing. That's why I hired you. Right. Oscar sat back, taking a long drink of coffee, although he was already wired and certainly didn't need it. I've been watching him for a few days. Only a few days? Gwen asked, glancing at the proliferation of notes on the data slate. I like to be thorough, Mrs. Wolf. Very thorough. First of all, I've been following him day and night. He doesn't go anywhere at all without me knowing about it. I've also been scouring his online presence. Social media and whatnot? I've discovered a lot. But there are two things in particular which I think might interest you greatly. Gwen leaned forward, paying close attention. I have to say, Oscar continued, that I have not personally witnessed any sign of infidelity. 
I have not seen him interacting inappropriately with any women. I haven't seen him talking to anyone he doesn't work with, beyond brief conversations with strangers in public areas. And he hasn't been going to anyone's house or apartment as far as I can tell. What about after work? Gwen asked quickly. Around seven or eight? Oscar raised his eyebrows. It's interesting you should say that. Of course, you would notice that your own husband has been going out. Have you asked him about it? Of course. What does he say? That he needs to go back into work and finish something. For the record, I never bought it. No? Why not? Gwen smiled. He's the CEO of the company. He has underlings for any task you could think of. My husband already went through his years of overworking. He used to put in 70 or 80 hours a week sometimes. But he always complained about it. He enjoys his work, but he's never been unhealthily obsessed with it. He wouldn't just go back into the office when he could be doing something else. Well, I can prove that you're right. He has not been going into work, but he has been going somewhere. The same place, each time, without fail. But not someone's house? Gwen asked. Just to be clear. Nope. This is some sort of business building. Take a look. He tapped a few items on his data slate, and a video feed popped up. It showed her husband stepping out of his car. The car shutting its door, racing off to find its own parking. Drake Wolf then looked both ways, over his shoulders, and continued up the sidewalk and through a tinted glass door into a building. All she could see was the entry bay, a sort of airlock consisting of two sets of doors, Certainly not an uncommon design on any commercial building, but it meant she wasn't able to see into the building itself. By the time Drake was walking inside, the outer doors were sliding shut. The tinted glass blocked everything. Your husband has been spending what I would call an unusual amount of time inside this building, said Oscar. Notice anything funny about it? Gwen studied the facade of the building for a long moment. No, not really. Is there something I should be noticing? It's rather featureless, Oscar said. Blank concrete walls. Nothing stenciled on the outside other than the address numbers. No business insignia on the doors. Nothing at all to identify what sort of enterprise occupies this building. I tried to look it up, but there's little information to be had. They claim to be an entertainment venue, but that's a pretty broad term. Tells me nothing. I'm not sure how they've been getting away with this, avoiding full disclosure. Could just be a bar, Gwen suggested. Then, feeling inspired, she added, or a strip club. No, Oscar remarked, shaking his head. I don't think it's either of those. Think about this, a so-called entertainment venue, which uses a lack of signage and tinted glass to hide what's happening inside. What does that say to you? I'll tell you what it says to me. I feel like this could be some sort of escort service. Frustrated guys go in, get their rocks off with a detached woman, and go about their lives. I've noticed that... Wait, Gwen broke in. You said you had no evidence of infidelity. And I don't. Nothing solid. This is just a suspicion. A guess. Anyway, I've noticed a pattern of behavior. He scrubbed back through the ongoing video clip, back to the moment where Drake walked up the sidewalk. You see here, he is quite tense, a bit rigid. Looks like a man who could use a hot bath and a cold beer, right? But check this out. He scrubbed forward. Time passed in a blur on the screen. How long does he spend in there? Gwen asked. On this occasion, he was inside for an hour and forty-one minutes. But look here. He brought the video back to normal speed, just as Drake was walking back out of the building. There was no audio, but Gwen could see that her husband was whistling. His lips were pursed, pushed outward. His gait had taken on a loose, swaying nature. All tension gone, Oscar acknowledged. Whatever he does inside this building, it really loosens him up. Gets out his frustrations. Gwen sat back. She remembered something she had read about years and years ago, a business idea that she had always thought sounded strangely brilliant. There used to be a place, she said, 
where people could go and pay a few hundred bucks. They would go into a room, put on safety equipment, and spend an hour or two smashing the hell out of things. Plates, glasses, furniture. I think there was even a premium package that let you beat up on a car. Oscar shrugged. Could be something like that. He does usually come out a little sweaty, sometimes slightly out of breath. But get this. He switched to a separate feed, from a different day. It showed Drake walking into the building in his work clothes. Business suit, tie loosened after his day of work. He always came home like that, usually belted down a bit of scotch or something, and lazed around for an hour or so before he got up the motivation to switch into pajamas. Later in the feed he came back out of the building, but now he was wearing different clothes, a t-shirt and shorts, sandals rather than his dress shoes. He had a gym bag with him now. Gwen recognized the bag. It was one he had owned for years. He must have had it held somewhere inside because he hadn't been carrying it earlier in the video. I followed him after this, of course, Oscar said. Guess where he went? Dry cleaners. To get his suit cleaned. He got something on it. Something that he didn't want the broader world to see. My God, Gwen said, shutting her eyes for a moment. She felt the universe shrinking around her. Then she opened her eyes, feeling resolute and almost explosively angry. Best not to jump to conclusions, Oscar cautioned. Maybe the demolition idea is right. Maybe his suit just got super filthy, covered in dust and stuff. Who wants to walk around in filthy clothes? Could be anything. You don't sound convinced, Gwen remarked. Well, I'm not. Not about the demo idea. I couldn't get much info on this building by traditional methods, but I was able to figure out a bit more, just asking around. Turns out this is some kind of exclusive club. You have to be a member. And of course, you have to pay to become a member. That's why I think it has to be an escort service. Prostitution made legal by some loophole exploited by the super-rich. But I'm not certain. I won't be until I can get in there. He sighed draining the last of his coffee and staring longingly into the cloudy dregs. Well, he said, remember what you told me? Hang back, keep your distance. That's what I've been doing, and this is what I've been able to learn. If you want more, we'll have to take the next step. Which is what? Gwen asked. Oscar smiled. I've taken the liberty of asking a few specialist friends to try and gain access to the building. They were able to hack into the security system. There wasn't a lot of information to be gleaned from that. The system is very basic, doesn't contain anything specific or tailor-made. But they're now able to create a fake membership account. They can even spoof an access card. It would get me into the building. Let me see what's up. The fake will be detected eventually, and will be locked out. But my friends tell me we would have at least two weeks to poke around before that happens. Plenty of time. Plenty, Gwen agreed, nodding. That's lovely, Oscar. Perfect. Just doing my job, he sat back, grinning proudly. But hey, maybe your friends are right. Maybe I am the best in the city. There's just one thing, Gwen said. Yeah? Gwen bit her lip. Would it be possible to put the membership in my name instead? I'd like to be the one to go in. Oscar stared at her a moment. Mrs. Wolf, that would be... Dangerous? Gwen asked after Oscar trailed off into silence. Sorry, I just don't know how all this works. It could be. Remember, we don't know what this building is all about. Could be anything, right? It's best if I'm the one who goes in. I've got plenty of experience with these sorts of tasks. But what if I insist? Gwen asked. Oscar studied her for a moment, unblinking. Then I would say more power to you. If you want to take this into your own hands, I guess I can help you out. Of course, there's the matter of... He made a gesture with his hand, rubbing his thumb, forefinger, and middle finger together. Gwen nodded. Obviously, you'll be paid, and a generous tip, too. You've been wonderful, but I have some other favors to ask. Shoot, Oscar said. This whole gym bag thing... He obviously has a place inside the building, his own alcove or locker or whatever. 
and I bet it's secure. Yes, both of those are safe bets. You're a clever one, Mrs. Wolf. He probably has a private room, Gwen continued. If I can't get into his room, I'll have no way of knowing for sure what he's getting up to. You'll have access to your own room. You'll be able to infer the purpose of the building, and that's about as good as seeing your husband in action, I think. Unless each client is after something different, Gwen supposed. Maybe when they decided to call themselves an entertainment venue, they weren't lying. Right, replied Oscar. It could be that they offer custom experiences, tailored to each person. Like I said, we won't know until we get inside. But you can get me inside, right? Yes, of course. And I also want to be able to get into my husband's space. Do you think your tech guys can do that too? Oscar thought for a moment, rubbing his chin. Those guys can do anything, but that's going to cost a bit extra. I can't expect them to do all this just as a favor to me, you know? I'll pay. Money's no object, Mr. Graves. Anything you need. But there's one last thing. What is it? Oscar asked. I need a gun, Gwen said. Something untraceable. A gun? For protection. Like you said, we don't know what I'm going to find in that building. Don't you carry one? Touché. The building's security will definitely pick up any ordinary gun, like the one I carry around. But... He glanced around again, checking for eavesdroppers. I can have one printed for you. Completely non-metallic. Mostly plastic and various resins. Generally undetectable. The security systems in a government building can usually find them, but I doubt this place has anything that fancy. Mostly because those systems cost tens of millions of dollars. Good way to throw your profits down the drain. When can you get it to me? Gwen asked. It won't take long. A few days. I'll keep in touch. But again... Money. Yes, I know. Don't worry, you'll be well compensated. So, once I have the gun, what do I do with it? Keep it as long as you like, but don't get caught with it. Printed weapons are illegal because they're virtually untraceable. There are no serial numbers, no registration. If you want to get rid of it, all you need to do is heat it in an oven to denature the resins, 200 degrees for an hour and a half, then let it cool down, smash it up with a hammer or whatever, and toss it in the garbage. No sweat. Thanks. What about ammo? A full clip will be provided. Hardened resin bullets. Technically not as deadly as the real thing, but if you shoot someone, they won't be able to tell much of a difference. There will be ten bullets. No more after that, unless you want to track down your own illegal weapons dealer and buy from them. Gwen pulled out her wallet and started to prepare a transfer of funds on her own mini data slate. Oscar scrawled out a figure on a napkin and passed it over. Gwen entered this figure in, then tacked on a healthy tip. She wasn't worried about money. Drake was worth a few billion, and even her own personal savings account held almost seven million credits. She gave Oscar a twenty percent tip. More than worth it to have a guy like him on her side. Very good, Oscar said after the funds flashed through his slate on their way into his account. A pleasure, Gwen. We'll meet back here again in... Well, just call me again in two days. Same number. I'll let you know. Thank you very much, she said, standing up and swinging her purse over her shoulder. Chapter Two Time Passed, As It Likes to Do As planned, Gwen called Oscar again two days after their initial meeting. They set up another meeting at the same coffee shop. They sipped java and engaged in about twenty minutes of casual conversation about nothing in general. On the way out, the P.I. discreetly handed over a wrapped bundle of goodies. Gwen shoved it into her coat, and they went their separate ways. When she got home, she laid out the bundle at the foot of their bed, the same bed where Drake used to make love to her, where he sometimes took her against her will when he came home drunk or frustrated about something that was going badly at work. In the bundle, there was a key card, blank white on the front, a simple magnetic stripe on the back, no information on it at all. There was a hole in the corner, 
so you could attach it to a keychain or a lanyard. She pulled out her wallet and tucked the card inside, behind her ID. Drake used to get jealous and suspicious in the past. He would sometimes snoop in her wallet, thinking he might find a phone number for an imagined boyfriend. He no longer seemed interested enough in her to do anything like that, but there was no reason to leave the card in an obvious spot. There were two other items in the bundle. One was a very plain-looking pistol, an L-shaped thing with a trigger and a trigger guard, completely blank and featureless. It looked more like a generic child's toy than an actual weapon, but that was probably the point. There was also an ammo magazine. It was opaque, so she couldn't exactly count out the ammo and see if Oscar had told her the truth, but she could see that it had at least one bullet in it. That was probably all she would ever need, she thought. She put the pistol and the magazine into her purse, tucking them in under the feminine hygiene products and the bags of snacks and toiletries she always kept with her. As the wife of a man of such high standing, she was expected to be beautiful and poised at all times. Such a task required preparation. It required her to be ready for anything. She couldn't so much as cry at a sad movie without rushing to the theater bathroom afterwards to fix her makeup, not without Drake giving her a hard time about it, reminding her of the rumors it would supposedly start. Now that she was getting control over herself again, now that her view of the world and of her own worth was somewhat purified, she saw how insane and evil her husband had been. Yet, now the only crime he was guilty of was that of ignoring his wife. These things made Gwen feel many different emotions, none of them good. There was shame and fear and sadness, and above all, a terrible fury which she could barely contain. All that was left to do now was to wait for the right moment to act. Dutifully, she went downstairs to get her husband's dinner started. Five days later, her husband came home from work, but only stayed long enough to scarf down a quick meal and inform her that he was going out of town on business. He would be back in a couple of days. He then gathered a few things and left without a word, without a kiss, without a hug, without even smacking her across the face for being so insolent as to demand a moment of affection. Gwen stood near the window and watched as he climbed into his car, as it backed out of the driveway and went racing silently through the streets. This was the opportunity she had been waiting for. It wasn't rare for Drake to go out of town on short notice. He usually does it about twice a month. There was no reason to suspect he was on his way to any place other than the airport. She waited exactly one hour. Sometimes when he left like this, he would double back a short time later to grab something he forgot. She paced back and forth, chewing her lip and tapping her feet, until she was certain he was gone for good. Then she went upstairs, breathing heavy with tension, to retrieve her purse. It was time. She couldn't wait any longer. The sooner she solved this mystery, the sooner she could stop that gnawing feeling in the back of her mind. No matter how good or bad the outcome was, at least it would be over. She walked out of the house, got into her car, and instructed the vehicle's maestro AI system to drive her to the address Oscar Graves had given her. It was six and a half miles away, in the heart of the city, on a major street, hidden in plain sight. No one walking by would give it a second glance. Even if they did, they would just assume it was some boring office building. Certainly not a door they needed to walk through unless they were in the mood to sit in a waiting room and sip weak, complimentary coffee for several hours. Gwen had the car drop her off quite far away. As she walked briskly along the street, turning her shoulders to pass slower pedestrians ahead of her, she found herself scanning the cars on either side. She half expected to see Oscar there. Maybe he was worried about her and was watching to make sure nothing bad happened. But she saw nothing. He was just a professional and his job was finished. He had been paid. For all she knew, he was at home feeding his goldfish right now. She saw the building up ahead on her left, as unassuming and plain as Oscar's pictures had made it seem. As she neared the building, a spike of fear went through her. She found herself walking past, staring forward, 
refusing to even glance at the tinted glass doors. She went as far as the corner, stood for a moment as though about to cross the street, then doubled back and returned to the building. This time, she pushed down her anxiety and nausea and strode through the doors. She was used to holding herself together in stressful situations, remaining proud and upright when other women would have cracked and dissolved. It was a learned skill, pounded into her by a devastating moment of trauma as well as the years of enduring a tumultuous marriage. As the inner door slid apart to let her through, she stepped into the lobby of the place, doing her best to look like she belonged. She was dressed in expensive clothes, well-groomed, elegant, beautiful in her own way. Never mind that she was a churning, twisting storm of nerves on the inside. Would they detect the pistol? Would they take one look at her and realize she didn't belong? Would something else happen? All those questions flashed through her mind. She felt her stomach flip, and her heart raced as though she was preparing for the start of a 100-meter dash. The lobby itself was a brief distraction. As simple and boring as the place looked from the street, it was anything but boring on the inside. The ceiling was all stained glass, looking through into an inaccessible lighted vault above. There were pillars all around, gothic in design, powerful and carved in intricate detail. The floor was marble, polished so that it was basically a mirror. Gwen tread lightly, afraid that she might slip and fall. Then she realized there was a velvet rug, narrow and long, which ran along a designated path toward a service desk. She quickly moved onto the carpet and followed it along. The nerves were back in full force. Now she was wondering what she was meant to do. Just walk into the building and find her room? Or did she have to talk to someone first? Luckily, she soon heard the doors opening behind her. Someone else was coming in. Gwen dropped to one knee and pretended to fix her shoe, letting the newcomer pass her. He walked up to the counter, pulling out his card. Good evening, and welcome back, Mr. Hanlon, the woman behind the desk said. Wonderful to see you again. I'm glad to see you're keeping in the habit. Gotta do it, the man said. I'm thinking a light session today, Margaret. Sure thing, Mr. Hanlon. We'll get it set up for you. Go ahead and swipe. Hanlon ran his card through a reader. There was a cheerful beep. You're all set, the woman confirmed. Hanlon thanked her and walked away. Gwen noticed he had a towel tossed over one shoulder. He was probably on his way to relax in a sauna or something while the facility set up his light session, whatever that meant. Gwen still had no idea what she was meant to do, but there seemed to be no harm in approaching the desk. She straightened up and walked forward. The closer she got, the more she realized that something about this Margaret character was off. She seemed... flat. Or inhuman in some almost intangible way. After a moment, Gwen realized what it was. Of course, Margaret was an android. The female form Gwen faced was just an interface, an interactive physical manifestation of a rudimentary AI. The artificial intelligence systems that powered these types of humanoid machines were nowhere near as advanced as the Maestro system that powered virtually all contemporary tech on the planet, but the androids still did a decent job of blending in at first glance. Hello, ma'am, Margaret said in a perfectly synthesized human voice. It wasn't particularly bubbly or overbearingly happy or patronizing. It was just natural. Can I help you with something? Yes, Gwen said, taking her wallet out slowly, trying to keep her hands from shaking. She slid her white card out of its slot and accidentally flung her ID to the floor. Quickly, she bent to pick it back up. Meanwhile, Margaret smiled away, unperturbed. Maybe she wasn't designed to be suspicious of such behavior. Gwen decided she was overthinking this. She took a long, slow breath and regained her composure. Yes, she said again. I've just opened a new account here, under the name Gwendolyn Myers. Oscar had told her he would use her maiden name to avoid suspicion. Margaret replied immediately. I apologize. I'm not seeing a member by that name. Try just Gwen, Gwen suggested, refusing to let her anxiety take over again. Yes, 
There we are. Gwen Myers. I see you haven't been in to see us yet. Your account was opened remotely. Would you like me to give you the introduction? So it had worked. Gwen tried not to let out a heavy sigh of relief. She didn't know how Oscar's guys had pulled it off, but they had. They must be very good at their jobs. She looked over her shoulder, saw that no one was waiting behind her, and nodded. Sure. I'd love to know what I'm getting myself into here. You know? Yes. We like to provide our clients with answers to any questions they might have. But before we go further, I would ask you to go ahead and swipe your card. The reader on the desk lit up. Gwen swiped her card, feeling confident, and was not surprised when she heard the same happy beep as when Mr. Hanlon swiped in. Very good, Margaret said. I'm very glad you've decided to join us, Miss Myers. We're still in a testing phase here, but our preliminary results are most astonishing. Results? Gwen asked. Then she shook her head. Wait. Let's start at the beginning. What is this place? What do you do here? We are one branch of a privately owned research facility, Margaret answered. The Horizon Group has made the betterment of humankind its primary goal. And this is the latest iteration on that goal. Gwen nodded. Now they were getting somewhere. She had heard of the Horizon Group, the parent company of the business that created the world-renowned Maestro system. A virtual AI system that was so advanced that you'd swear you were talking to a flesh-and-blood human if you didn't know any better. Gwen's husband also used to talk about the Horizon Group, the way they had come onto the business scene and exploded in size and revenue, all while remaining quite mysterious in regards to their inner workings. It was unfashionable to display suspicion towards them, however, because of all the good things they did, mostly outreach, aid to those in need, aid to poor families, sick people with little to no access to adequate health care. They even funded and dispersed the cures to various diseases. The world, as far as anyone could tell, was a much better place with the Horizon Group in it. Gwen suddenly felt a bit foolish. If her husband was coming here, it must be for some business reason. If he was working with the Horizon Group, it was no wonder he had become a better person. No wonder his tension was gone when he came walking out. Whatever he was doing here, it couldn't be bad. Could it? Still, she didn't know for sure. Okay, Gwen said. What do you do here exactly? The main purpose for this facility, Margaret said, is to take the first step toward eradicating certain destructive behaviors, or at least give them a harmless outlet. Ultimately, our goal is to reduce or even stop things like domestic violence and all forms of sexual assault. Gwen felt her heart leap. So her husband was coming here to somehow work out his aggressions. She wanted to ask more, to really grill the AI, but she didn't want to show her ignorance too much and risk arousing suspicion. How is that done exactly? She found herself asking. Margaret smiled, gesturing toward a stack of pamphlets. You may take a copy of the introductory reading materials. When you're ready, we can get your first experience set up. Okay, that sounds good, Gwen said, though she had no idea what was going on. Could you tell me how to get to my room? I'm bad with directions. Certainly, Margaret confirmed. In fact, I can do better than just telling you. The android reached down, lifted a small data slate off a lower shelf, and passed it over. Gwen took the slate. On it was a virtual map of the building, identical to the real version, except that she could zoom through it at great speed. Every hallway was marked and color-coded, and she could move into a bird's eye view if she wanted. Thank you, she said to Margaret. I suppose I can find my own way now. She moved away. Part of her expected that she would now be discovered. Some alarm would blare. A bunch of men with guns would come running out to apprehend her. But none of that happened. A moment later she entered a wide hallway with a median running down the middle of it, encased in glass. Under the glass, an entire miniature ecosystem thrived. Flowers and grass, ferns and mushrooms. The glass was fogged with moisture. The covered median seemed to stretch along the entire hallway, 
and even up the stairs, unbroken. It probably spread through the entire facility, she thought. Perhaps it was a way to relax people, or to infuse the air with fresh oxygen. Either way, she wasn't here to marvel. Using the map, she quickly discovered where her room was and headed toward it. She passed a few people in the halls, but they all seemed to be employees of the facility. Dressed in the same jumpsuits, with the same blank look on their faces. She didn't even know for sure whether they were real humans. They didn't look at her or act suspicious, and that was all she really cared about. As she walked along, she noticed something on the map. Another hallway, running parallel to hers, which led behind the rooms. Like a ghost or a mirror image. They were probably maintenance and access corridors for the workers, she decided. A way for them to set things up without intruding on the peace and calm of these main halls. Up a set of stairs, around a bend, she finally approached her room. It opened with a swipe of her card, and she stepped into what at first glance seemed like the nicest hotel room she'd ever been in. And she had been in more than her fair share. Everything was neat, shining, and beautiful. Top-of-the-line furniture and fixtures everywhere. The floor was more solid marble, without a single seam or line for anything to get stuck in. Without thinking, she went over and sank into the bed with a long sigh. She even kicked off her shoes and wiggled her toes around for a minute, luxuriating. As the thought of a bubble bath briefly passed through her mind, she remembered why she was there and sat back up. Just then, she heard a knock at her door. She got up, walking over the hard floor in her socks, and opened the door. One of those blank-faced employees was there, holding a plain white envelope. Apologies, he said. This was meant to be given to you at the front desk. Mistakes are made sometimes. What is it? Gwen asked. Something left for you by one of our other clients. Gwen nodded, took the envelope and shut the door. She went to sit on the bed and opened the thing. Inside was another key card, along with a note which read... Hope all is working to plan. Hope you find this note. You're probably wondering how I got it in here, but don't ask. Doesn't really matter. This key card is an exact copy of the one your husband uses. It will let you get into his room. Good luck. Via con Dios. What a perfectly Oscar Graves way to end a note. She threw the note into her purse to be destroyed later. She put her shoes back on, checked to make sure she still had her gun, then left the room. She walked slowly, giving herself as much time as possible to reach her husband's room, trying to push down her nerves again. Unfortunately, their rooms were quite close together. His was just at the end of the hall. His room was clearly different than hers. First of all, it had a set of double doors rather than just the one. It even had a special designation on the wall next to it. Rather than just a number and the initials of the occupant, it had also had the title Sweet 2A stenciled beside it. But the card reader was the same. Gwen paused for a moment, considering her options. If her husband hadn't checked in at the desk first, would it be seen as strange that his room was being accessed now? Would the system flag it as a suspicious event, lock her out, and then send someone to investigate? There was only one way to find out. What was the worst that could happen? She might get her fake membership dissolved, kicked out of the building and banned for life. Then she would be right back where she started. No change. She swiped the card. A long moment later, the cheerful beep came, and she heard the whir and click of the door unlocking. She twisted the handle, pushed, and stepped inside. Yes, this was definitely a suite. Just the entry room itself was enormous. The ceiling was ten feet high, the lighting bright and brilliant. Artwork hung on the walls. Each piece fit Drake's taste perfectly. He must have picked them out himself. Gwen shut the door and continued down a hallway. There was a kitchen to one side, a bar complete with a set of stools. There were rooms everywhere, doors, most of them shut. It looked less like a hotel room and more like a very expensive condo a place where someone could easily live indefinitely. This must be some kind of premium package, Gwen thought. 
she didn't even want to know how much Drake had spent on this. And at any rate, she couldn't know. He kept most of his finances separate from hers, and he did what he wanted with his money. In a moment she arrived in the main room, a sort of living room. There were chairs, a sofa, a coffee table, and a mess. Two of the cushions on the sofa were dislodged, shoved out of position. A chair was lying on its back. There had been two glasses on the coffee table. Drinks. Both had spilled. Gwen approached, bending low to have a closer look. Ice. There were still bits of solid ice, dotting the carpet from the spilled drinks. She stood up fast, nearly turned and ran, then steeled herself. After all, wasn't this what she really wanted all along? A confrontation? Yes, she thought. Drake had lied to her. He had lied about going out of town. He was here right now. She was about to catch him in the act. If only she had come ten minutes earlier. From the state of the living room, Drake and his companion had either gotten into one hell of a fight, or else they had engaged in wild, passionate sex. Knowing him, it could be either. In the earlier days of their relationship, when there was still real passion between them, Gwen and Drake got pretty rough with each other in the bedroom sometimes. There was a towel on the floor as well. Gwen briefly entertained the idea of unfolding it, seeing what sort of stains were there. But the thought made her stomach flip again. She abandoned it. So what now? What had she learned? First, going just off what stood before her eyes now, it seemed that this really was just a fancy hotel run by some kind of escort service. But if the Horizon Group was involved, it was a sure bet that something else was going on. Gwen found herself frozen in place, torn between wanting to run away and forget everything she saw, and wishing to delve deeper, to find the answers to all her questions. A voice suddenly called out from deeper in the suite, making Gwen jump and her scalp prickle. Drake, it called, is that you out there? It was a woman. Gwen smiled nastily to herself. She knew it. If the bitch had heard her walking around, she obviously hadn't been as stealthy as she should have been. But it didn't really matter. Apparently Drake wasn't in the suite right now, or else his little hussy wouldn't be confused as to the source of the footsteps. Fresh anger gave her a needed boost of strength and conviction. Gwen touched her hair, adjusted the hem of her blouse, and strode in the direction of the voice. She came around a corner and saw an open door ahead. A bedroom. The bed was messy and unmade. There were handcuffs attached to the bedposts. Clothes scattered across the floor. Gwen felt nauseous again, though not with fear or anxiety. It was anger and disgust that churned within her belly now. Gwen stepped into the room. Something moved at the corner of her eye. She turned to face it, and for a moment thought she was looking into a mirror. How often had this happened? How many times in her years of marriage had she stared at her own half-naked body in the mirror, at her own bloody face? Split lip, bruised cheekbones, busted nose. Claw marks on her chest, finger marks on her throat. How many times? But she wasn't half-naked. Not now. She was wearing the same clothes she'd put on this morning. And her husband hadn't hit her in a long time. Hadn't touched her at all, not even to rip her clothes off and have his way with her. She wasn't looking into a mirror. She wasn't looking at herself, but somehow, she was. The battered woman that stood before her appeared to be an exact copy of Gwen. A twin, but since Gwen was quite literally an only child, she knew there was only one logical explanation for this woman's existence. The woman was a clone. She had to be. Gwen stepped backward, unconsciously lifting her hand to cover her mouth, eyes widening in shock. The impostor reacted even more strongly, sinking to the floor, using her arms to cover her nudity. She shrunk away against the wall, hiding her face. Wait, Gwen said, her mind moving too fast for any coherent thought to form. Wait a second. She stumbled to her right, hit the bed, and fell into it. It was a very nice mattress. 
extremely comfortable, plush like a cloud. She spread her hand over it, feeling the smooth, cool sheets. The touch helped to ground her and bring her spinning thoughts back under control. You, she said. Who are you? The clone said nothing, just burrowed her face further into the crook of her arm. Gwen now saw the speckling of blood on the panties, the deep fingernail gouges on the creature's back. There was blood on the bed, too, little dots of blood that were a strange purplish shade of red instead of the deep crimson color that Gwen would have expected. Gwen almost gagged. A sound echoed through the suite, a door shutting, footsteps, heavy and masculine. Gwen felt herself shoot upright as though she had been struck by lightning. Without thinking, she ran toward a closet door, shoved herself inside, and pulled the door shut again. It was one of those swinging, folding doors. It even had little angled slats in it, about eye level, which she could see through. Gwen stood perfectly still in the dark, hanging shirts draped over her shoulders, and waited. Drake appeared in the room a few moments later. His tie was loose and hanging. His jacket was draped over his arm, leaving him in just a crisp white dress shirt. There was blood on it as well. The cuffs were rolled up. The fly on his dress pants was up, but the button was undone. If he had gone out looking this sloppy, this messy, he must not have left the building at all. Gwen was lucky not to have run into him in a hallway or in the lobby. Drake sighed, approaching the cowering clone. He put his hands under her arms and tried to pull her to her feet. She didn't move. I'm sorry, he said. I'm really, really sorry. Honest. Gwen knew that tone of voice, completely insincere. There was not an ounce of genuine sorrow or apology in it, pure manipulation. It was a tone she hadn't heard in a long time, since before her own beating stopped. The clone said nothing, and she didn't seem to give away what she had seen. The real Gwen walking in and finding her. Drake sighed, cursed under his breath, and straightened up. He lifted his jacket, straightening the sleeves and fixing the curled hem as he walked toward the closet to hang it up. Gwen froze for a second. Then she tried shuffling over to her left. She hit a wall, so she went right and hit another wall. The closet was very small. Nowhere to go, nowhere to hide. Drake pulled the door open, saw her, and stared in blank surprise for a moment. Then he smiled casually, grabbed Gwen by the front of her shirt, and pulled her out into the room. Not violently, not with any malice, but also without care or tenderness, like a man moving a heavy piece of luggage. Gwen found herself reaching for her purse, but it wasn't there. She glanced back. It had fallen from her shoulder when Drake pulled her. It was still sitting on the floor in the closet. Drake, stop! she shrieked. Let me go! She heard the pathetic note in her voice, that note of resignation. Wow, Drake said, tossing her onto the bed, pinning her down to get a good look at her. They really got this one spot on, right down to that nagging attitude. He spoke quietly, just talking to himself, like she wasn't even there. Meanwhile, his hand on her throat was choking the life out of her. Her vision was already narrowing, going black. She could barely speak, but she managed to force out two words. Fuck. You. This actually made him pause. He lifted himself off her a bit. His hand left her throat and instead moved to her wrist. He shoved her arm against the bed and held it there. Fuck me, he snapped. How about fuck you? He reached down with his other hand and started undoing her pants. Gwen tried to sit up. Now that she had some oxygen in her brain, her first thought was to fight. Get herself out of this position. Once she was free, she could convince the idiot that she wasn't a clone. She was real. She didn't make it very far. Drake slapped her hard across the face, making her see stars. She fell back down, and then he was choking her again squeezing even harder than before. Bitch, he growled, face going red, spit flying from between his clenched teeth. You stupid bitch, 
How many times do I have to tell you? Tell her what? She didn't know. One of his pointless justifications. He always liked to have some nonsense reason ready, a justification for why he was beating the shit out of her. Maybe it made him feel better. But he didn't know it was her. In his mind, he was taking out his anger on a clone. Focusing what was left of her consciousness, Gwen forced out a few last words. You were... supposed to be... out of town. His mouth opened. The redness went out of his face, and his grip on her throat lessened. A clone wouldn't have known about the lie he had told his wife. And for that matter, it probably wouldn't be wearing his wife's favorite blouse or the pants she had bought years ago, or the damn wedding band on her finger. It only took a few moments for Drake to connect the dots, to realize what was actually happening. He leapt away, throwing up his hands and dancing backward like a man who had gotten too close to a hot fire. Gwen, he said. Gwen, what the hell are you doing here? She sat up, coughing and wheezing, sucking in ragged breaths. In a moment, she had recovered and sat there, staring at her husband. He stared back at her, opening his mouth, sticking out his tongue, desperately trying to think of something to say. Chapter 3 I did this for you, Drake snapped, now standing across the room, arms angrily folded across his muscular chest as he glared at Gwen, who was still seated on the bed. Bullshit! This was for you! You sick bastard! What kind of fool do you take me for? Gwen hissed, her eyes red with a mixture of anger and astonishment. I did it for us, to save our marriage. I thought that... Well, it's been proven to work. You remember Ian? My friend from college? Gwen nodded. Ian was the CEO at a completely different company. Another rich asshole. He joined the program too. Before I did, Drake explained. It saved him. If you had met him and his wife five years ago, you'd wonder how they weren't divorced already. But now they're like newlyweds, I swear. It's crazy how well the program worked for them. How well it works for all of us. It really is quite revolutionary. What the hell are you talking about, Drake? How is this sick shit revolutionary? Because it works, Gwen. Can't you see that? Drake exclaimed. How long has it been since I put my hands on you? About thirty seconds, Gwen snarled. Well, before today, I mean, Drake stammered. Oh, so you're not counting today's ass-kicking because you thought I was a clone? Gwen snapped. They're not clones, Gwen, Drake said smugly. It's like a mixture of a clone and a machine. They call them synthetic humans because the organic parts, which is about 40% of the body, are synthesized using genetic material from... Do I look like I give a shit, Drake? Gwen shrieked. Whatever this is, it is wrong. No, you're wrong. This program helps people, Gwen. People who otherwise can't help themselves. You always hear these stories about wealthy men. Great men who ruin their careers because of impulses they can't handle. Things that are largely out of their control. Impulses, Gwen scoffed as she climbed to her feet and glared back at Drake. Like the urge to rape and beat the shit out of women you supposedly love? You mean that kind of impulse? Drake sighed. Whatever, Gwen. I don't know why I'm even discussing this with you. It's completely beyond your understanding. The statistics show that the program is working, okay? Instances of sexual assault and exploitation in the workplaces impacted by the program are down by almost 60%, and the numbers are even better when you boil it down to the churches that were impacted. Well, over 60% in less than a year... Gwen's eyes widened with surprise as she realized the gravity of Drake's words, and she shivered to even think about it. Images flashed through her mind. Priests renting rooms in this building so that they could have full access to a synthetic child. A child that essentially belonged to them, upon whom they could exercise a depraved hunger so that it wouldn't surface in their normal daily lives. You can't argue with the results, Drake continued obviously fishing for a response from Gwen. But the assault is still happening, Gwen said. 
It's just being shifted somewhere else. Oh, God, here it comes, Drake scoffed, smacking the front of his head in frustration. I guess this is the part where you start advocating for the copies, huh? You and all your goddamn causes. What is it with you? You're deflecting, Drake. You think I can't see that? This isn't about me. We're talking about you and your decision to partake in this sick... This... This... I don't even know what the fuck this is. This cannot be legal. Keep your goddamn voice down, Drake said brusquely. Or else what? Gwen shot back. Are you going to start beating the hell out of me again? Go ahead, Drake. Do it. Show us just how well this bullshit program works. It does work. The program helps more than you could possibly know, Drake said through gritted teeth, obviously fighting the urge to launch an attack. You're pathetic, Drake. And these people are only interested in helping wealthy people who aren't used to being told no. People like you. People who don't even understand the meaning of the word. Was this program really saving anyone? Or was it just creating new victims and hiding them away? Gwen looked at the synthetic copy of her, who was still hiding in the corner. Silent. We're sick, Gwen, and we know it. There's no pretense there, Drake remarked, taking a self-righteous tone. But at least we're seeking treatment for ourselves. I come here, and I get it all out of my system. That way I can be normal the rest of the time when I'm in the real world. When I'm with you. You haven't been normal at all, Gwen responded. Even right now, you're trying to manipulate me. Trying to make me feel like my opinions are stupid. But I haven't hurt you. Not since I joined the program, Drake protested. You almost killed me just now, Drake! She stared at Drake, but he looked away, unable to meet her gaze due to the shame brought on by the truth within her words. Can they die? Have you killed any of them? Gwen asked. He glanced at her. What? Them. The synthetic whatevers. They bleed, so I assume they can die. Have you ever killed any of them? It's a simple question. He looked away again and said nothing. But there was guilt etched all over his face. There was no doubt about it. He had killed at least one synthetic copy of her. Probably more. Gwen's next thought was an inevitable one. A natural one. How long would it be before the synthetics weren't enough? Before his anger became too great and he started taking it out on her again? If he could kill a being that looked exactly like her, what was to stop him from eventually killing her too? God only knows how much practice he had had. There was only one course of action. One way out. It was time to finally do what she should have done years ago. To be the strong woman she always used to assume she would be before she met Drake. She got up, walked over to the closet, and picked up her purse. What are you doing? Drake asked, his voice hollow. It was the hollowness she dreaded, the void that always preceded a self-righteous storm of anger. I'm leaving, she said. The next time you see me will be in court. And then never again. She felt a thrill, a rising triumph in her chest. She felt invincible. This was it. She had finally managed to say it. Drake took a step towards Gwen, then paused and just stood there, seething, face red, hands balled into fists. What are you talking about? he asked. I did this for us, you ungrateful bitch. I promised myself that I'd never hit you again, and this is the thanks I get? Gwen gestured toward the synthetic version of herself. But you have been hitting me, Drake. Can't you see that? That doesn't count, Drake snapped stomping his foot. It's synthetic, Gwen. It isn't real. Tell yourself whatever makes you feel better, Gwen said, turning toward the door. It won't bring me back. Have a nice life, asshole. She started to leave. Drake laughed at her. You're screwed, Gwen. Absolutely screwed. My lawyers will destroy you. Do you realize that? I don't care, Drake. I'm still leaving you. You're a goddamn babysitter, you stupid bitch. Looking after our kid was the only responsibility you ever had. Drake fumed. 
and you couldn't even do that right. Tears welled in the corners of Gwen's eyes as images of their late daughter flashed into her mind. Their daughter was only a toddler when she died, and her untimely death was simply a freak accident. Completely outside of anyone's control, but Drake never stopped blaming Gwen, and as always, he evoked her memory as yet another means to control his wife. Goodbye, Drake, Gwen said solemnly, without bothering to turn and face him. Really? You're really going through with this? You're throwing it all away over what? That thing? Drake scoffed, now pointing at the hapless synthetic Gwen. It doesn't even have a soul. Gwen pulled the pistol from her purse and finally spun around to face him. Neither do you, she said firmly as she thrust the gun before her. Before she could talk herself out of it, she pulled the trigger. The bullet hit Drake in the middle of the chest, and his eyes widened with terror as he realized what had happened. He tried to speak, but the air in his lungs went out of him in a choked rush. Gwen watched in silence as Drake fell back onto the bed, then slid down the smooth sheets and crumpled to the floor. Blood spilled from his chest and spread across the marble as his last few movements grew smaller and smaller. Finally, he stopped moving altogether. She approached him intending to check whether he was alive. For a moment she felt numb and distant. The next thing she knew, she crashed back into herself, full of violent anger, as though every bit of rage she had suppressed during her marriage came surging out of her all at once. She screamed at the top of her lungs, kicking and punching her husband's dead body, clawing at his face, punching him, crushing his ribs and teeth with blows from her feet and hands. She pummeled him, pulverized him. It was a concentrated delivery of every moment of pain and injury he had caused her over the years. No words came out of her, just a series of bestial roars and insane screeches as she let out her anger. And for a moment, she knew how good it felt to let go. She knew how Drake must have felt when he found this place, when he realized what it would allow him to do. Suddenly, the suite was full of people. Security guards. Some of them were armed. But they didn't shoot her. They grappled her away from Drake and yanked the gun out of her hands. But the gun was useless. The plastic shattered and cracked. She had been using it as a blunt object to crack her husband's skull and split his skin. Gwen was pulled away, kicking and screaming at first. Then she went numb and completely still. Epilogue By the time Gwen fully recovered from her incident and became completely cognizant of her surroundings, she was in a gray and featureless room. She was sitting in a chair. A table stood in front of her, with a heavy steel loop jutting out of the top. She was chained to that loop, her arms completely held in place by the heavy-duty restraints. Directly across from her was a door, a sterile, gunmetal door. She kept waiting for it to open. Sometimes she would hear people walking by. Voices, some of them cheerful, others quite grave. There was a mirror on one wall of the room. She knew what that meant. It meant she was being watched, studied, and recorded. Finally, a projection eye that she had not previously noticed flickered to life. A hologram flashed into view, showing a svelte man in his sixties with an outrageous crop of gray hair. He was also sitting in a chair somewhere far away, or maybe somewhere in this very same building. His arms were draped over the sides of the chair. One long leg was crossed over the other. He looked quite relaxed at first, but there was a well-hidden tension in his gray eyes. Mrs. Wolf, he said, I trust you can see and hear me quite well. To test whether he was watching or just listening, Gwen nodded her head. He was staring off in some random direction, not looking at her directly, which probably meant he was watching a camera feed on a nearby screen, watching her on it. Good, he said. My name is Mark Chambers. I'm with the Horizon Group. Usually I don't preside over legal matters, but I thought, in this case, that it would be best if I became directly involved. This is a delicate matter, after all, given your husband's recent investment in the program. 
He leaned forward, reaching out. His hand vanished beyond the range of the holographic receiver. He seemed to be fiddling with a slate or some other computer, reviewing information. You claim self-defense in this killing, he said. Is that correct? Gwen nodded again. He threatened me. I know my husband. I don't think he was going to let me leave that room alive. Perhaps. But perhaps not, Mark responded. In any case, Mrs. Wolf, it is our position that we are not liable for what did happen or what might have happened to you in that room. Obviously, you were not authorized to be there. A fact that is made clear by your first crime. That, of course, being forgery. Gwen remained silent in part due to the sweltering anxiety within her, but also out of a desire to fully digest the man's words before she provided a response. And then there's your second crime, murder in the first degree. You strike me as an intelligent woman, Mrs. Wolf. Any person who's smart enough to con their way into this facility should also be smart enough to know that your claim of self-defense is unlikely to hold up in any court, given the facts of the case. I, I don't believe... You shot your husband in the chest, and now he's dead, the stern man interjected. Our findings show that he wasn't moving when he was shot, and blood spatter shows that he was quite far from you when the shot was fired. You were hardly in danger at that moment. You had a gun, and he did not. You easily could have fled that room and gotten away from him. But you killed him and then you delivered a post-mortem beating for the ages. A very sadistic and savage act. You don't know what I've had to endure because of that man, Gwen said, her vision blurring with tears. Actually, I do. Your husband was a violent man. He certainly had the potential to kill you as well. That is the entire purpose of the program, after all. Back to the matter at hand, though, Mrs. Wolf. You find yourself in a great deal of trouble at the moment. No matter how you try and spin this in court, the evidence will tell the true story. That you murdered your husband in cold blood and then beat him to a pulp after you fired the shot that killed him. You'll likely end up in prison, probably for the rest of your life. That is the only possible outcome. If this case makes it to court, that is. What do you mean? Gwen asked, seeing a light at the end of the tunnel for the first time in years. Mark Chambers sat back in his chair, looking pleased with himself. We have each other by the balls, Mrs. Wolf, in a manner of speaking. We are doing great work here, no question about it. But the legality of it all is a bit gray, to say the least. For the time being, anyway. It would be tragic for the whole thing to be cut short because of a single unfortunate incident. It would be equally tragic for you, so recently freed from the tyranny of Mr. Wolf to be shoved right back into captivity in the form of a cold prison cell. Wouldn't you agree? He sat forward now, clasping his hands together in a gesture of pleading. I'm prepared to offer you a deal, Mrs. Wolf. You will remain silent about everything you saw here, and we will do the same regarding the murder of your husband. I'll even go as far as to throw in a synthetic with which to replace him. Of course, we could simply bury you and replace you both with synthetics, but that could get messy without at least one of you still alive to keep the act going to perfection. The AI functions are admittedly a bit... rudimentary at this time. In any case, I don't think that will be necessary. I think you'll find my offer to be quite generous, yes? Gwen thought for a moment. She was horrified by what she had seen at the facility. More horrified by what she hadn't seen the unknown atrocities being committed behind the closed doors that she had not gained access to. That said, she didn't want to die, and she certainly didn't want to spend the rest of her life in prison. Not after she had finally clawed her way from under Drake's thumb. In the back of her mind, she wanted to continue fighting the good fight, but at the end of the day, she was irrevocably human. And that flesh and blood need for self-preservation proved to be much stronger than her desire to do the proverbial right thing. But wait. She had an idea. One that simply popped into her head just before she could respond to Mark Chambers. She wasn't sure of how well it would work, but she had to give it a try. Okay, she finally muttered. 
I'll take the deal. Mark separated his hands, then brought them back together in a single clap. Excellent, he exclaimed. That is quite a relief, Mrs. Wolf, and it is certainly good news for both of us. What if I kill him again? Gwen asked. The synthetic, I mean. What if he's just like Drake? I won't live in fear again. I can't, not after what I've been through. How do I contact you if I need another replacement? Mrs. Wolf, the synthetic will look like your husband and his organic components will share the same DNA as your husband, but I assure you he will not act like your husband because he won't have your husband's mind. The synthetic bodies are powered by a simple AI system. They can keep up a good act if you program them right. They're mostly autonomous, but ultimately their level of free will is completely up to you. I can have one of my associates explain the programming details, and we would be willing to provide additional copies in the future if necessary. However, this could only be arranged via one of our membership packages. And there it was. Gwen's spur-of-the-moment plan had worked like a charm. Just like that, she was now an official member of the program. What better way to destroy an organization than from the inside? She knew her next steps were unlikely to bring down the Horizon Group as a whole, but she could at least draw attention to the particular division that ran the program. Her only hope now was that she could attract enough attention to actually get something done about it.